Hello and welcome to today's webinar on using cemetery records in your family history research. My name is Ginevra Morse, Director of Education and Online Programs at New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history. And today's uh, webinar, we're excited to be reaching people from really around the world. So giving today's presentation is David Allen Lambert, Chief Genealogist at NEHGS. David has been on the staff of NEHGS since 1993. His genealogical expertise includes specialties in New England and Atlantic Canadian research, military records, and Native American and African American genealogical research. You can also hear David every week on the online radio show and podcast, Extreme Genes. He is the author of A Guide to Massachusetts Cemeteries, Hut Off the Presses, now in its third edition. So in the next 45 to 50 minutes, David will provide tips on locating the final resting place of your ancestor, what records are likely to assist you in that search, how to find and use cemetery transcriptions, how best to prepare for a visit to a cemetery, and finally, David will look at various types of headstones that you may encounter during your during your search. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question in the questions panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those after the presentation. There is no handout for this session, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow you can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. And that recording is freely available. You do not need to be a full member of NEHGS, um, but you do need to have at least a guest account, which is a free login to access that recording. So basically, if you miss anything on today's first listen, you can always go back, watch, rewatch, pause, um, and really get what you need from this session. So without further ado, I will turn things now over to David. Thank you, Ginevra, and thank you for all tuning in today. This is a wonderful chance to uh, talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and obviously with the third edition of the Massachusetts Cemetery Guide just coming out a couple of days ago, uh, I think the timing of it's pretty good, too. Uh, just a quick note, I have been wandering cemeteries since children are were not allowed to wander alone. My parents would take me off on a road trip and say, here, go off in the cemetery and play. They weren't kidding. When I was seven years old, I got interested in genealogy. And I would often take a pad of paper and a pencil, and I would go out and look for Revolutionary War gravestones or the oldest headstone or some really interesting epitaph. So cemeteries have been my playground since I was a kid. And as a genealogist, I'm sure in a way they become your extra archive. Uh, they are really outdoor museums and some place that you can find a plethora of information that both help with local history as well as your family tree. Wait, well, let's start off by finding the cemetery. And what we're going to do under this section is we're going to talk about the various uh, steps and records that you can find in regards to uh, your research before you actually get to the cemetery. So sort of like finding the records. So let's go on. So we're going to discuss uh, in detail about burial records, of course, vital records, which often will list the place of burial or give you at least a clue as the location. Uh, we'll talk about some of the online cemetery registries, such as find a grave and also billion graves. Um, there are also other records that you can use, which are pretty obvious to most, but in case you're new to genealogy, obviously an obituary or a death notice in a newspaper is going to give you some clue as to perhaps where the cemetery is the person's buried. Now, oftentimes early obituaries might just say a funeral from the home. Obviously, funerals were done from homes years ago versus at a funeral parlor. So oftentimes the uh, body would lie in state, the wake would occur after a couple of days and the body would be transported, transported over to the actual cemetery. Now, if you live in a very small town, it may be easy to figure out which cemetery it is if the obituary doesn't note it. Um, but if you live in a city, there could be any number of cemeteries. So knowing when the cemetery started, 
and knowing where they're located are as a key. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the guide to Massachusetts cemeteries. I was tired of guessing. All right, funeral home records. The ideas of funeral homes kind of came into play in the early part of the 19th century, mostly in urban areas because people were not wanting for health reasons to actually have a funeral. If say, somebody had died um, of something contagious, the funeral may have been the body was removed and then brought right to the cemetery or the graveside service was the entire funeral. Um, the idea of going to a funeral home are often started um, again in the 19th century by people that were making furniture. Furniture makers often would make caskets. Hence the idea of sort of collectively doing all of the above. They would buy a hearse, they would have elaborate funerals or very basic ones. Um, and funeral home records are great. Uh, in my own hometown community, we've had the same uh, funeral homes since the 1860s. Uh, I'm actively hoping to get those records digitized and indexed. Um, but you in your own community as a local historian may find that funeral home records exist and are a plethora of uh, resources because sometimes the vital records don't start that early. But the funeral home records may go early enough. If you know where the location of a funeral home is and you know they're about to go out of business, you might inquire as to where their records might be on deposit at a local historical society or library because they are a wealth of information. Collective memory and family stories. Now for me, I can remember um, going on a Memorial Day to the cemeteries with my grandparents and putting flowers on the graves and you know wandering around in general. But maybe you have that same memory that you remember going with your great aunt to a cemetery and that's where your great great grandfather was buried. And you kind of remember that it was in Bangor, Maine, but you don't remember exactly where. So maybe there's some collective memory that you can use in your own genealogical knowledge as to where you may be searching. Some of us don't start genealogy as kids and you know you might have been 30, 40 years ago. Um, published genealogies are another source. Genealogists from the 19th century on would often include the place of burial of someone that they were writing a genealogical sketch on. In some cases, they even show photographs or engravings of what the stone looked like or include the transcription. Probate records don't seem like a likely source, but if you think about it, they often do. Um, there may be something in the uh, estate where there was a cemetery plot purchased and it names the cemetery plot. Might be a cost associated to a particular funeral home. So you back up right to the funeral home records. Now you know the funeral home in question. There may also be the charge for carving a gravestone. And if you can track down uh, the, that there was a gravestone cut, you at least know when you go in the cemetery, there's a good likelihood you should probably find a headstone for your ancestor. Okay, the first tip I wanna talk about is determining whether the family last resided and checked for a burial ground nearby. So you wanna find out where the family lived. Uh, so obviously there is always a possibility that your ancestor may have died in one town and was sent by carriage or wagon, three or four or five towns or county lines over to be buried with their first spouse or their parents or whatever the case might be. The idea of embalming did not come about till the time around the Civil War where bodies down south were prepared and caskets were sent up north for burial during the Civil War. Now early on in the 18th and 17th century, you may find that burial records occur. Now for some towns, you're not gonna find the town keeping them, but more likely the sexton of the church. Where here's an example of the first parish church of Stoughton in 1760 with burials, uh, with some cases actually giving the age. So in here, this case, we have an infant of Edward Shale who died the 1st of February, 1760 then followed by Keziah Smith with no indication. Then you see three more infants, actually four more infants, and then you find one that's very vague, Mrs. Tilson. Then you find someone with a first name that is actually an African-American slave, uh, which we just have the date of burial. No age, no cause, but sometimes burial records get a little bit more biographic than you might imagine. So you wanna look in the church uh, yards, but find out if the church in particular, the Congregational Unitarian, or whatever the case might be, um, where the burial records are. Uh, this, the sacraments of the church may include a collection, uh, in this case for Catholic, it would be non-sacramental records for burial records. Uh, you may find a Jewish synagogue, might have a record of the um, 
funerals that occurred and where the bodies are interred. And with Jewish cemeteries, uh, there are often certain sections, like in uh, West Roxbury, Massachusetts, the Baker Street Cemetery has numerous small cemeteries. So if you look at a death record, it will tell you a particular congregation has a cemetery located in West Roxbury, Massachusetts, but it is only one part of a larger Jewish cemetery. So looking for the burial records is going to be uh, different for each century and for each church, but do look for them because oftentimes there may not be vital records early enough to indicate uh, a cemetery. An example using Massachusetts, which is totally applicable for the rest of the United States for the most part, there are certain sets of records I'm going to show you, which I think you'll find uh, across the board, like if you were searching for Michigan, California, Wyoming, uh, there are some cases that are published federal records. So in the case of the pre-1850 Massachusetts Federal Records Series, or the official series as we call it, or also known as the TAN books, you may find an abbreviation when you're looking for a birth, or a death. Uh, so for instance, you might see GR, which stands for gravestone record. And that same terminology could be GS for gravestone as two words and the word record. Um, lower, you'll actually see that there is um, the typical keywords from um, the gravestone. So GR1 is a gravestone record at the ancient burying ground in Bradford. GR2 is the ancient burying ground in East Bradford, later Groveland. And GR3 is a burial place of smallpox victims in East Bradford after Woods Groveland. So here in one town, you have three potential cemetery locations. And these are indicated because either one of two things has happened. One, they're very detailed burial records or death records. Or two, the possibility is that the person that was putting together the vital records for the town went out and transcribed the gravestones and put them in the vital record series. Here's an example from Abington uh, deaths. As you can see in here, uh, if we go down to Caleb Beal, which is sort of in the middle of the page, um, you will see that he is in GR12. Now this would actually indicate at the beginning of the book what GR12 or Gravestone Record 12 is. At the top where you see uh, the Bats family or Bates, uh, there's one in GR1. So you can see in this community alone, there are at least 12 particular cemeteries. Now in smaller communities, you would think, wow, how could there be 12 large organized cemeteries in such a small town as Abington? Oftentimes, these are family cemeteries, which may include just a small amount of graves or a couple of dozen that are buried in the back yard of a family farm, uh, or there may be a community cemetery that was too far afield to go to the uh, local parish uh, churchyard, or they may have not been affiliated with them. So there could be any number of reasons, um, but it is very common to see sometimes up to uh, 20, even 30 cemeteries in a small town, in, for instance, in southeast Massachusetts. But I want to let you know that sometimes these transcribers got a little out of hand. So let the researcher beware. On the left-hand side are birth records. Now, you wouldn't think that birth records are going to come up with cemetery, but think about it. If a gravestone actually has a full date of birth or somebody's done the calculation of 74 years, 8 months, 12 days from it, you might be able to figure out when the person was born. For Cambridge, Massachusetts, the compiler back in the early part of the 20th century went out and transcribed gravestones with birth dates, never taking into fact that the person may have never even lived in that town, let alone even been born in that town. My third great-grandfather, Henry Poor, is listed on the left as being born June 20th, 1769. The source is GR3. He's buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. His gravestone does, in fact, have his date of birth on it. However, he never lived in Cambridge, nor was he born there. On the right-hand side, I can find the same reference to Henry, born June 20th, 1769. What's the clue? His parents are listed. So if you're finding a lot of birth records that just happen to have no parents, it's not a bunch of uh, orphan children or foundlings. These are actually probably gravestone dates. And luckily for Cambridge, we can see what the source is, whereas GR3 references back to the cemetery he's buried in. We're very lucky in Massachusetts. We're the first state in the union to require statewide vital record registration in 1841. Uh, birth records are not so good, but deaths are 
fairly uh, very regular, including for the city of Boston. The example I've chosen here uh, is a burial, for, a burial for Charles H. Poor, who was an infant of one year of age. He was the younger brother of my great-grandfather. Now, on the statewide record here for the city of Boston, Charles is a year old. He's male. He's single, born in Boston. His father is Alexander L., mother Ann W., and he died from convulsions. Doesn't say any place for a cemetery. Unfortunately, you may find that in the state that you live in or province, that they may have not recorded the cemetery till later part of the 19th century, or in some cases into the 20th century. And you don't start finding the exact cemetery in Massachusetts typically until the 19 aughts. You do see the city, town, and place of death, or rather the place of interment as by the town, the place of death, and uh, that is listed by the 1880s. But these early death records don't include it. Now, what I'm going to show you is that it's not always the state record. Before the state record was sent into the, from the city or the town, it was sent from an original record from the city. So here's Boston's death in 1850, and Charles H. Poor, age one um, month old, actually, uh, he... He is listed here dying at 34 Piedmont Street, and he is born in Boston, and he is buried at Tomb 111 Central Ground. A couple of things. Now, I know where the family's living now, so I can go into looking at city directories. And then I can go into other things that, is there a problem here? Yeah. Here he's listed as a month old. If you remember in the state record, it said he was a year old. So sometimes numbers can be transposed wrong. But here's the big clue. It says Central Ground 111. Well, what's that? Obviously, it's not a street address. What is it? It's actually a tomb number. And I went and visited Charles's grave not long ago, not a far walk from any HGS. Tomb 111 is owned by Martin Smith and my great-grandfather's brother is buried there. Who is Martin Smith? He's an undertaker who decided to buy real estate, real estate for the dead. They would often buy old tombs, clean them out, or organize them. That would allow more burials to be placed in it. So there are often multiple unrelated burials in a tomb. This can be very confusing because you would think that, all right, maybe the rest of my family is buried there. In fact, Charles's sister is buried in another cemetery in two separate tombs. His parents are buried in a completely different one. So it just happened to be what was convenient. And this is very typical in urban areas in the 19th century, in 18th century. Now we're going to talk about finding the grave itself. Now there's a few different options we're going to discuss. The first one will be proprietor lists. Now proprietor lists or lot owners are oftentimes the first thing you find, especially if a cemetery is an organized cemetery in the 19th or 20th century. They may have a list of the lot owners or proprietors. We're going to also talk about lot cards or plot cards. Uh, these are the cards that actually indicate who's buried within the plot, especially if it's a multiple grave. We'll talk about different types of cemetery maps, both large scale and some that are hand drawn on a local level. Then we'll get into different types of gravestone transcriptions because in the 19th and early 20th century, it wasn't really standardized. So you can find any number of things and some people get overly creative. Uh, then we'll talk about online cemetery registries like find a grave and billion graves. So here's an example on the right-hand side of the proprietors and lot representatives of a particular cemetery. It's telling me simply the name of the owner, who's the representative, and the plot number. Now, this other thing is it's telling me is where it is located and sometimes the dimensions in square feet. So if we go down to the third one, Charles H. Lindsay is, owns lot 2119 on Clover Path, and it's 150 feet square. So these published proprietor lists often list alphabetically the lot owners. Obviously, there's another list that might list by the plot number, and it doesn't have an index, so you have to scour through it. Um, the plot name or number is often given. Sometimes you'll even get the uh, date the plot was purchased. And as you can see, in this case, it does say the location. Cemeteries were laid out in such a way, at least in the 19th century garden cemeteries, where along the row where the headstones were, they would call it a certain path or a way or an avenue or a street. And this is typically so that you could find them. Each lot within that row would have a designated number 
a signing so they would know who would be buried in lot, say, uh, 2119 Clover Path. So if there was a new burial, they would look at a lot card. That would then tell you how many burials are, lo are still available. And how many burials are in each plot? Well, it's going to differ on the size of the lot. If you look at something that's 150 feet square versus one at the bottom, which is 660 feet square, obviously speaking, there are going to be more than one person buried there and multiple people, especially if they bury them double deep, which meant that the first casket went down six feet. The next one, when the next burial, say a husband or wife, they would dig down, and of course, this is the days before granite vaults. They would hit the first casket or the remains of the last person Person, and they would set the other casket on top. Hence, two burials, one grave. Here is an example of a plot card from Mount Auburn Cemetery, and this is located on lot 1340 Cypress Avenue. Mount Auburn Cemetery, laid out in the 1830s, was one of the first garden cemeteries organized in such a way which wasn't like a typical urban cemetery from my first screen where it showed you Granary Cemetery where it was congested, all the graves were right on top of each other. This is organized with fences and gardens and hills and sets the burials sort of back into nature. So here is a 10 grave lot and what I'm finding here is both the name the date of the burial, not the date of the death. A lot of times people look at these dates and say, well, that doesn't line up because my ancestor died on that date. Remember, burials, unless a person that was of some contagion, was probably a couple of days after the fact. Then it gives the year, month, and day of the person. In this case, uh, we can tell that there's the lot was purchased in the upper left. It says October 15th, 1846. It gives the volume and page to the actual records itself. And there's a lovely diagram. The diagram basically showing where each one of the foot markers are, the smaller rectangular, with a large central obelisk or uh, upright stone with a G probably indicating it's granite. There looks like there's steps leading up to the curbing of the actual grave. And this is for someone who's a little near and dear to our heart here at NEHGS. This is for the family of Lemuel Shattuck, one of our founders and our first vice president. Now here's an example of a map. This is for Forest Hill Cemetery. This is a cemetery laid out in 1848 uh, in the suburbs of Boston, getting to the point where the urban cemeteries like Granary, King's Chapel, and Copps Hill were overcrowded. The tombs were filled to capacity. These larger suburban cemeteries started sprouting up. This one in uh, Jamaica Plain. As you can see, there's a lake in the middle that was probably obviously dug for the occasion or may have been a swamp <laughs> that was converted over. And you have these lovely streets and avenues laid out. Uh, my own great-grandparents buried there on Foxglove Path, and I'm a lot owner there. The nice thing about these larger cemeteries is there often is an office. Keep in mind, just like most people who work Monday through Friday, that's generally when the office is open. And we'll talk a little bit about planning your trip later. But do not try to expect to find somebody there on a Sunday. Uh, call in advance, and uh, definitely it will save you a lot of heartache, especially if you've come a far distance. Now, in a small town, there may not actually be a cemetery office, but maybe at the local historical society or public library, maybe even at a place like NEHGS, and I'll be talking about different transcriptions in a bit, or maybe the DAR library, where someone has gone to a cemetery, drawn a sort of a rough scale map. See, in this case, they're showing the larger markers, say in the upper left-hand side with smaller markers around with numbers. This would actually refer to a list of what burial is in, in each particular grave. So you can use that map in conjunction to locate a burial. And of course, this might be a cemetery that's so small that doesn't have a cemetery office. I'm very pleased that Find a Grave has been such a great resource and for free for so long. And now is, of course, uh, run by Ancestry.com. But to use an example, we're going to look for Lemuel Shattuck, who I had the plot card for at um, Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. So I put in Lemuel Shattuck, and I just put the year of death, which is 1859, and I hit search. And here I find an entry for Lemuel. Now, from the plot card, I could tell there were gravestones. So a lot of people have been using these online sites and say, oh, there's no headstone, or oh, there's no entry. They must not be buried there. Really, folks, do keep in mind it's a volunteer effort. Not every cemetery uh, is uh, 
cut their staff and they're entering every gravestone. In fact, very few would. It's local historians and genealogists like you and I that are going out in our free time, scouring these cemeteries, replying for the requests for photographs, and making things available for people online on Find a Grave and Billion Graves for free. So in Lemuel Shattuck, we know from the plot card there were gravestones, at least there were in the 19th century, and I assume they're still there, uh, but nobody's gone and photographed them yet. Uh, there is a lovely portrait, however. Uh, you'll find the same portrait hanging in the reading room on the seventh floor at NEHGS of Lemuel Shattuck, his wife, and his daughters. And come and ask us about the ghost in the portrait, which is a story for another day. Now, for Find a Grave, I've been active in it for now uh, over 16 years, and I've put in probably over close to 10,000 gravestones and memorials, not all for my family. In fact, for the most part, I am also, besides a genealogist, a local historian. Uh, I've decided that it was probably best in the summer and spring to go out and photograph all the gravestones that are usually requested of me in the winter months of uh, November through February and March, where people in warmer climates expect us to go out and find gravestones. You may relate to this. So I now have placed online thousands of gravestones in my town from the 19th and 18th century, so I can clearly just send a hyperlink, first have to go out with a snowblower to find the stone. One of the things that I'm showing here is the availability of creating virtual cemeteries. I'm a baseball history fan, so I've visited uh, a couple of baseball graves in my day, so I created a Baseball Hall of Famer site, uh, virtual cemetery, Civil War veterans from or buried in my town, veterans who are not members of our local Grand Army, the Republic Post, so forth and so on, and I've actually been able to also create a list of the burials of my ancestors. So if I have entered it in, that's really easy. How about people that have put on memorials? I can click Add to Virtual Cemetery. In this case, is one called My Ancestors, and there are 98 gravestones. Think of the hundreds and thousands of ancestors you potentially have. A quarter of my ancestors is from New England, and have been here since 1629. I have British ancestors. I have Atlantic Canadian. But to the best of my research, only 98 memorials actually have gravestones. And as you can see in the middle, some of them are not such great shape. Uh, the second one down is Mary Perkins Bradbury. She was accused of witchcraft in 1692 and is actually the ancestor of my distant cousin, Doris Kearns Goodwin, which I had the opportunity to work on her genealogy. Now, of course, besides find a grave, um, the next new kid on the block became Billion Graves. Now, a lot of people say, why well, use Billion Grave when Find a Grave was there? I say use both. And the reason I'm saying is, so I did a search for Lemuel Shattuck. I didn't find it. How about if I only use Billion Graves and I didn't see that reference in Find a Grave? Using both will attribute the point that you may have somebody who favors one or the other to do their transcribing. Personally, if you're going to spend the time, why not use both? Uh, in both using it to transcribe and record gravestones in your local town, uh, and it's a uh, security that having it in two places makes it a lot easier for someone to find. Who knows, somebody might tag a grave and find a photograph of the person during their life. It might be a distant cousin. So utilizing both, and of course the price is right, they're both free. Now since 1845, NEHGS has been collecting the collective past of America, and we have spent innumerable uh, times going out and getting collections. May they be gravestone, collections or family papers, but sometimes there were early photographs. Sometimes in the early part of the 19th century when photography was in its infancy, we'll find tin types and early album and prints that actually show gravestones. In some cases the gravestone no longer exists or is in far worse condition now. So having some of these early gravestones is an amazing way of looking at transcriptions on a more three-dimensional level. Now, you might go out to a town and find out that your ancestor shows up on the poor rolls or may have died as a pauper. Oftentimes, cemeteries were set aside in the back or a portion was set aside for the indigent folks in the town. There may be a poor farm cemetery in the community. Oftentimes, these are not marked graves. So you want to turn to pauper records or almshouse cemetery records that may exist for a community your family lived in. Oftentimes when someone got older and maybe their children were nearby, fell upon hard times, and in fact, 
they would be cared for by the town almshouse or cared for at home, but their burial may have not been uh, being able to be cared for. Maybe their spouse lived in another state. Um, they need to be buried someplace, so oftentimes the almshouse cemetery. Are there marked gravestones? Not often. In most cases, they were originally marked with probably a wooden marker or a wooden cross, etc., or marked with a field stone whitewashed with the person's initials or scratched into it. Location of these actual records can vary. You can find them at public libraries, historical societies. Sometimes your local genealogist or historian of the town may know. I often find a great tip is to actually go and call the public library for a community which you're researching that you may not be familiar with. Ask them who in the town knows about the cemeteries and knows most about genealogy of the uh, former families. If you get in touch with he or she, they often may be able to tell you if or not uh, the poor farm records exist or if there's any indication of who was buried there. Maybe there is a burial book. NEHGS, of course, has over 28 million manuscripts, and within them we have plenty of cemetery transcriptions, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and some of them actually talk about almshouses, etc. But oftentimes you find an indication of burial, but not specifically where the grave is. Published histories are useful. The one on the right-hand side show the burials from an almshouse, but this is from an archaeological survey. Yeah, unfortunately, they had to dig up the cemetery to determine where the folks were. All right, now we're going to talk about different cemetery transcriptions, and they're going to vary, as you are about to see. So there are types abstracts of gravestone details arranged alphabetically. Of course, people are not buried in alphabetical order, but sometimes someone took the uh, extra care of transcribing them, decided to not do an index, so let's alphabetize the stones. In this case, from the Rehoboth Cemetery, the Bosworth Cemetery there in Rehoboth, Mass., uh, you'll find that this family is put together uh, in alphabetical order. Now, of course, sometimes it's just one whole small family. Now, in this case, uh, maybe Daniel, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, and Gardner all buried in a row like that, but more chances are that they probably are randomly in the cemetery, and they just happen to be arranged. This is a small cemetery, no doubt for uh, very few burials in there, and these could be the surviving stones, but there could, of course, be other burials. Now, sometimes they're typed abstracts arranged in order of burial. Now, this is a burial number that which could have came from a burial record book. So they may have had burial number 706 in 1855 uh, was for Alice Dolliver. As you see, the next burial is May 20th, May 25th, May 26th. So they're actually in order. But if you look on the far right, you see the lot number in the section. As you can see, they're not all buried side by side or next to each other. So these are coming from burial records. However, if you look at the indication, it says gravestone inscriptions. These really aren't gravestone inscriptions, but are in fact burial records. Sometimes you get handwritten abstracts arranged by cemetery row. So somebody went grave by grave and wrote down an abbreviated version of what was there, or maybe some sidebar note. So in the case of this first one, Lieutenant Simon Crosby, he was 81 years old when he died the 2nd of February, 1771. Then the next person gives you their date, that's 1747. The one next to it, 1727. Jumping ahead nearly 107 years later, you have a John Crosby, uh, age 69, that has an SAR marker on it. So here's something that may be a clue. Maybe they were a member of the Revolutionary War. Maybe the marker is marked incorrectly. Uh, oftentimes, flag markers can lay in the wrong spot. But this person took the extra effort of abbreviating the details, getting the vital records out, but also notifying little clues. The next one obviously says who the uh, Francis Crosby is the son of Mr. John and Mrs. Abigail Crosby. Now that could be on the stone or it could be a genealogical fact that the person happened to know. Now sometimes people get a little overzealous with their information and when they do a gravestone transcription they take it upon themselves to add more detail. That's altogether fine but you might want to include the inscription in verbatim form then the biographical sketch. This is kind of combined as you'll see. We have Alan Thayer, born on this date in 1783, died in 1844, with his parents and their date of marriage. Chances are the 
parent's marriage date is not carved on their son's gravestone. Um, so there are a variety of things you might find incorrect. Also the fact that there is a little bit of an incorrect bit of vital records right there. Someone born in 1783 probably didn't marry in 1906 to his wife born in 1786, unless they were very advanced in age, uh, and it's probably 1806. So be careful with transcriptions, and this one from the George Cemetery obviously has a gravestone for Alan and Polly Thayer, but all that additional information might be right or may be incorrectly assigned to someone with a similar name. Now, there are also typed abstracts in cemeteries in a row with abbreviated gravestone data. And the reason I put a question mark is did somebody abstract the information? So, for instance, Fernando Cortes, who died in 1911, born in 1861, does his gravestone have his full date of birth or his full date of death? Or maybe his full date of death with a calculated year, month, and day that puts you back to 1861 with no date of birth. Or perhaps it's similar to a 20th or 19th century stone where the large family monument just gives the year of birth and the year of death. You decide, but don't rely just on transcriptions. Go out to the cemeteries, search, find a grave, a uh, billion graves. Or if you want to add your ancestor to a particular cemetery, you can go in to find a grave and billion grave and make a request for a photograph to be taken. And who knows, maybe someone else can settle that question for you ahead of time before you visit. Some people go the extra mile. This is a verbatim transcription with, with the stone sketches and poetic epitaphs. So here a gravestone in 1876 for Charles French gives his date of birth and it talks about where it's located. That's on the face of the monument. So obviously his wife is on the back, uh, Roxana French with her name and date. And then of course the little poetic epitaph or a Bible verse that may be on there. What's really nice is these are done in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th century. Mostly they're on marble and slate stones and that these are usually the inscription that has sunk into the ground or have sugared away, the terminology we use with marble or limestone stones, where it's sort of eroded and just sort of flaked off from the stone or sugared away. Uh, so that may not be visible anymore, but in this case, it was when the person saw it when the stone was probably fresh and new. Uh, and you also see that there's the detail they're doing is they're even mentioning the little foot markers, the one that says father and mother, that's in the same proximity. Now here's a verbatim transcription with the loss of the order of the original transcription on the stone. So this person's adding all the detail in, but we don't know where how it's transcribed on the stone. So if the stone, for whatever reason, was destroyed by flood or just vandalism, whatever the case might be, you wouldn't be able to resurrect the stone with the verbatim inscription line by line. So in this case, Julia Ann, wife of Charles H. Beebe, died April 30th, 1869, age 52 years. Obviously, that was not on some small font written across the entire first line of the stone. It was broken up in some way. So the detail is there, but the loss should be indicated by line breaks. The next one is inscriptions abstracted and arranged alphabetically, and each gravestone is assigned a number. So the genealogist or historian went through, alphabetized all the families. Here's the listing of the Adams family at the River Street Cemetery in West Newton from NEHGS's records, and each gravestone is assigned a number. Now, is that number to a map? Is it to the master original list as they walk the cemetery? And perhaps, is that number even indicating on a map where the burial is, which could really be a benefit if that accompanies the transcription collection. Some people went further and had local history love to the point that they wanted to write articles for the local paper. This is a transcription from the early part of the 20th century where somebody went out and transcribed particular gravestones located in Cambridge, Massachusetts from the 17th century on into it looks like the 18th century with very abbreviated information, but obviously indicating at one point that there is this cemetery located in Cambridge with these burials. Town and local and county histories are such a vast array of potpourri of different things. Uh, and oftentimes they have gravestones or cemetery transcriptions indicated in there. Uh, at least in the most part, some town histories will talk about the burying grounds that survive or some that have been moved 
and lost time. Uh, and oftentimes they'll include um, gravestones, some with very poetic or humorous epitaphs. Here is some from the history of Dunstable, Massachusetts in 1873, where the author went out and copied not just the names and dates, but the actual line by line of the poetic epitaph located at the bottom of the stone. Some gravestones are published with cemetery abstracts. So this, uh, in the case, this, the listed alphabetically, of course, again, this is more of a 20th century list. The dates are abbreviated, so August 31st, 1864, versus the month spelled out. Each gravestone has been assigned a number, and in this case, the number is a location. So that's probably on a grid system to show you where the grave is, because uh, it's alphanumeric on the numbering. Now, sometimes gravestones even go to the point of being transcribed. Uh, the late Bob Dunkel and also uh, Anne Lanehart, who is uh, her co-author still with us, uh, they published this wonderful book called The Old Cemeteries of Boston. Remember I mentioned about line breaks? And here we have a gravestone um, in the memory of slash Mr. John Barnacote slash the date with the superscript from the gravestone. That's so February with the ROI superscript. D for 23rd superscript. So it's almost to the point that if we couldn't find that stone in 100 years and you found a very faded one, you could probably recreate that stone line by line to represent what was on it. So um, Bob Dunkel and Ann Lanehart went meticulously through some of the early burial records and the early cemetery inscriptions of Boston uh, and did that. So it makes it one-stop shopping for Boston dead early in the part of the 17th through early 19th century. And it wasn't just genealogists of the 19th and early 20th century. People like Robert Savory have gone out and continued to transcribe cemeteries in their local area, as he's done with Cedar Grove Cemetery in Dorchester, Massachusetts, where we constantly get lovely little updated books where he's done a particular cemetery section and hasn't gone to just doing the transcriptions, but it's actually written biographies, looked for photographs, and brought the stories of those in these lots back to life. Common gravestone abbreviations, and of course you can go back and look at these slides at your leisure starting tomorrow, but you may find that AE, uh, or Latin uh, for etatus as age of, referring to the age of death may occur on the stone. Another thing that you might find is that the person's age might say in their 33rd year. Well, that means that they were approaching 33, but they had not obtained 33, so they were probably, of course, 32 years of age and they hadn't reached their birth date. That might lend to a clue for you. You also see uh, Y, which is a substitute for the thorn symbol, which signifies the th sound, and thus the fifth, ye, the, and yet that, yes, and this which come, are commonly in early 17th and 18th century gravestones. Usually do not see it anywhere in the 19th century. It's sort of forgotten terminology and inscriptions do not appear in such a way. And then of course, OB for Latin for obit for she or he dies. Visiting the cemetery itself. A little bit of a checklist and uh, before you visit a cemetery, Location of the cemetery in the 21st century. I can tell you that family members of mine got very frustrated when uh, a young Dave Lambert would pull out a 19th century map and say, it looks like the cemetery is right here over by the old mill. Yeah, well, the old mill doesn't exist anymore. And maybe that cemetery has been completely uh, up and moved. Who knows? There could even be a Walmart where the cemetery was. Look for current maps. Contacting the cemetery or parks and recreation office in the town will give you a good indication of where particular cemeteries or places to search are. Also looking on find a grave, looking on billion graves, looking at town histories, or seeing what transcriptions exist may save you a little frustration, and who knows, they may map out where the cemeteries are. Has the cemetery been transcribed? Why go there with good intention and planning on photographing and transcribing an entire cemetery if it's already been put on find a grave and you can do it from the convenience of your laptop and your living room. 
Cemetery office hours, again, keeping in mind that they have limited hours, especially in the wintertime if it's the inclement climate, uh, that they may not always be there to answer the phone for your genealogical queries or often actually having active cemetery activities such as funerals. So you may have one person in the office. Do leave a detailed message, a suggestion. Don't leave 25 names that you want them to look up. Ask for one main person or a plot. Do you have anybody named Smith that's buried in your cemetery? It's not a great icebreaker for getting a hold of a cemetery office. It has far more important things than to look at their old records. One suggestion, if you do get a hold of the cemetery office and they don't charge for things, maybe you send them a gift card to a local coffee shop or something like that uh, to thank them or to entice uh, a donation to maybe a perpetual care uh, fund that they have in the cemetery to help with indigenous burials that were there from long ago. Plot cards are locations of graves. Getting them ahead of time is going to save you a lot of time. One of the things that I do if I know that there's a cemetery plot but there's no indication of a gravestone is I will kindly ask the cemetery a week in advance if they wouldn't mind going out with some sort of a wooden stick marked or spray painted at the top or maybe a ribbon tied around it that I know in the general area where it is but when I go there there's no headstone. At least I can pay respects where my ancestors are buried with their non-marked grave. File papers are important. The original documents associated with the probate file may give you that clue. Remember, looking in them might tell you about the existence of a cemetery plot, or again, regarding buying a gravestone. Record books and copy books of certain probate files copied into bound record books may not include these receipts. So do try to track the file papers down on the probate before you get into uh, giving up after looking at just the record copy books. Also be mindful of the rules and regulations. When are the cemetery gates actually open? Going there before operating hours or afterwards could be considered trespassing. You don't want to get arrested for just wanting to visit your ancestors. Is photography allowed? Believe it or not, in some cemeteries, not just so much because of find a grave and billion graves, the idea of photography may be prohibited because there may be an active funeral. The last thing you would want is someone to snap a photograph from the neighboring gravestones as you're trying to bury a loved one. Perhaps also they don't allow photography for personal reasons unless it is your family plot or your ancestor. Do inquire, especially if you're going to do a uh, free-for-all for find a grave or billion graves. Also, gravestone rubbings? Well, unless it's a really sturdy, large granite monument that won't topple on you, I would suggest highly against it. Unfortunately, with the pushing along a grave like an old one, uh, this one right here on the ground, could have been a result of somebody putting too much pressure just to get that last bit of detail and snapped or broke the stone. Uh, the other thing is sometimes stones like that are made out of sandstone, whereas Connecticut is loaded with them in Western Mass, they are so fragile that you rubbing against them could be taking the last remnants of the inscription off once you move the paper that you've taped onto it. Um, do be considerate. Remember, these are memorials. Uh, they're supposed to be left for a lifetime of genealogists to find, not just for you. Remember, not everyone has a gravestone. As you saw with the 90 plus markers that I have in my family tree, uh, not everyone I have has a stone. I know plenty of burial locations where there isn't a gravestone. And of course, I would love to buy gravestones for all of my ancestors that I know don't have stones, but I would think that probably food and uh, oil and keeping a roof over my head is probably more important. But I must say that I have added at least three or four over the past 25 years. Let's talk a little bit of the tour of the graves, the typical type of gravestones that you may encounter in the material they're made of. Now, early on in uh, the colonial days, when a person is buried, oftentimes there may have been worry of Indian hostilities and knowing that your numbers have been depleted, as it was with the pilgrims that they would be buried uh, out on the hill overlooking uh, where Plymouth Rock is now. These burials were basically buried away 
didn't put a gravestone. Well, there weren't gravestones to be had. Early gravestones came over as ballast in ships. Were they marked with a simple field stone, one of the best crops here in New England, or were they marked with a wooden marker or something very simple? Of course, some graves are marked by a heap of stones for two purposes, maybe to find it again, or perhaps it was to prevent uh, animals such as wolves to dig up a fresh grave. Wooden markers were oftentimes used in the 17th century before slate markers came about. These wooden markers, of course, are not going to last outside in the elements for 300 or 200 plus years. So oftentimes, if a gravestone was not used to replace it or a continuous remarking of the grave, the location could be lost. You probably know what I'm talking about. You walk into a cemetery where you know, sure enough, there have to be burials. There's one or two stray gravestones around, and you know that if um, push came to shove, archaeologists would find graves, uh, but they're probably not been marked for years. I want to introduce you to one of our uh, most important historic artifacts in my estimation. It is the earliest dated 17th century stone from New England. On the left hand side are part of the fragments that make up the original gravestone for Barnard Capon who died back in 1638. Now the gravestone itself is more vindictive of the style from the 1660s and 1670s versus say the 1630s. Um, but is probably marked after the fact when his wife died in 1653. Um, the stone, when it was actually uh, being replaced, it looks like in the 18th century uh, by this st stone on the right, that probably fragments were found uh, and cared for by the family. They ended up in NEHGS in the 19th century, and we've cared for these fragments ever since. The gravestone folks, is marked with a stone on the right, so have no fear, we haven't taken a gravestone from a cemetery. In the 17th and 18th century, oftentimes the macabre look of the winged death head, the winged skull, adorned many of the gravestones in New England, or also down the eastern seaboard. This idea of death with resurrection with the wings is often seen in the uh, indications of slate and sandstone gravestones. The stylization of these gravestones continue on to right about the time of the Revolutionary War. So luckily, sometimes in communities, there is a push to save these earlier stones. The one right here from my hometown broke when a gale in 1811 came and a large barn board came and smacked the oldest gravestone in half. These brass uh, fittings on the stone have been in place there to keep the stone in one piece for over 200 years. By the time of the 18th century, um, cherub or death head portrait stones come into play. Early on, you would often see these for people of the clergy, but oftentimes you can see some that indicate children, uh, a female versus a male, occupational type related stones. And were they considered sketches of the person um, after their death was something, a quick sketch done of what the person looked like by the stone carver during the funeral? perhaps, or was someone just said, well, we know that uh, mother had curly hair, and then they would do a stone that had a person with curly hair. I actually have seen a couple of these from my ancestors, and no, I know they're not exact portraits, but the idea that a physical characteristic could be indicated on their gravestone is quite exciting. As you can see here, the same type of stylized stone is used for multiples, as you can see here in the case of two cherubs or two children. Uh, that are buried in this cemetery in Sharon, Massachusetts. Now, sometimes it is replaced simply by scroll work. This gravestone from 1776 has just artistic scroll work with no religious, no fraternal, or any indication whatsoever other than to apply a very fanciful design on the actual gravestone. By at this point in time, in 1776, the use of death head starts to be diminished from the gravestones. Slate was the typical stone that was used. In fact, in most cases, it was brought over as ballast in ships from England. Uh, and a lot of the earliest gravestones were very thick uh, because nobody had the cutting capabilities to make them smaller. One of the other natural stones that was found in New England besides slate was actually sandstone. 
As you can see from this gravestone here, most of the sandstone has eroded completely away or has washed away. The idea of the sugaring of all the little small sand crystals has actually worn off the actual stone. This is a typical stone where you would probably not want to do a gravestone rubbing. By the 19th century, in some cases in the late 18th century, the use of marble and limestones for gravestones come into play. Sometimes you had very fanciful stones that would actually have an urn or a mark or some sort of a marker, maybe a hand pointed upwards to heaven uh, or a cross or sometimes a Celtic cross that are adorned the stone itself. Sometimes you had very commonplace markers that just had the names and dates. Um, in this case, an indication of who the person is married to. You also, on the right-hand side, find that the military markers starting in the 1860s of the Civil War, in fact, headstone applications are searchable from the 1860s on into the middle part of the 20th century on Ancestry.com for those that applied for military markers. Not every marker is indicated in this collection, but you'll find a fair amount of them. These upright military markers, unfortunately from the Civil War, are often fading away because of the act of the stone sugaring or wearing away. Now, not all markers were made out of stone. Some were made out of cast iron or zinc. These cast iron gravestones from the uh, 19th century are quite interesting because they would have been just cast just like a cast iron stove. They would have been put into a mold and the iron would be casted out and the person would have a gravestone. Sometimes these were painted. There's indications that they may have even been painted in multiple colors. Uh, but in most part, uh, they would have probably been black with white lettering on upon them. By the 19th century, the commonplace monument material was granite. In this case, it would have any sturdy amount of chiseling could produce intricate designs like the three rings of the odd fellows on the left hand side. Or how about this perfect spherical stone made of the Quincy granite. Ironically, the gravestone on the right was for a granite courier from my hometown who was the grandson of Deborah Sampson, one of the female heroines of the Revolutionary War who posed as a man uh, to serve her country. But Myron Gilbert's gravestone is just perfect. It almost looks like you could roll that right down a bowling alley. Modern gravestones also are made out of granite in the most part. There are, of course, other types of stones that people use. And my family headstone here from my folks both have a headstone with a surname on the front as well as their full dates on the back. wonder what genealogists thought that would be a wise idea. It was me. Uh, and then, of course, my mother and father's location in the plot itself are with footstones. Now, folks, just a bit of advice. If you have a footstone at your ancestor's grave and you can't find it and you know it's there, kind of dig around the grass a little bit. The frost or nature will eventually cover these over. So who knows, in 100 years or so, these may not even be seen at all. So an upright monument is always a wise idea in my estimation, uh, but searching for a foot marker and cleaning around the edges of it is always a good idea. You may find that there are bronze grave markers, as this case here for a World War I veteran in my hometown. Uh, the stone, besides having the infantry regiment, indicates Max Scheer's religion that he is Jewish with the Star of David on the stone. Uh, and it also get the dates, um, the dates located here for his date of birth and his date of death. Then, of course, we do have the gravestones that are a little bit more elaborate than everybody else's, as we hear of the burial of Elvis Presley here in his home in uh, Graceland down in uh, Tennessee. So you have very detailed information with actually a lot of genealogical information. Besides telling you who his parents are, it tells you that he is the father of uh, his daughter. Now, I am very pleased to announce that a guide to Massachusetts cemeteries is now available. If you are listening to this on November 15th and you're interested in a signed copy, we're running a special. Go to AmericanAncestors.org and you can go to our sales tab until midnight tonight and order a copy and I'll personally sign it for you uh, and each book will be sent out in the next coming weeks. Um, 
My book lists thousands of Massachusetts cemeteries. It has an alias, a name, an age, or the earliest gravestone of each cemetery. I have provided the address and contact information for each cemetery when applicable. The published and manuscript sources, both manuscripts here at NEHGS, or a very large collection located in the DAR Library in Washington, D.C. All of the GRs are referenced, remember those? Gravestone records from the Massachusetts Vital Records are indicated, so you don't have to second guess what the old cemetery is in Bradford. And of course, contact information for the cemetery department, parks, recreation, or town or city clerk is provided. Why use this guide? This is a bit of a breakdown. So in each town, I include the year of incorporation in the parent town that it came from. So for instance, if you were looking for your ancestor and you know that the cemetery, or they may have lived in Burlington, how about earlier graves? Well, maybe you want to search Woburn. I've provided the town hall contact information. All this information has been updated and checked. Uh, providing each cemetery with their alias names, because sometimes there can have more than one name for a cemetery, the date of the earliest burial or the earliest inscribed gravestone. It varies on each one depending on the information provided to me from the particular cemeteries or the towns. There are also the location of the cemetery address, the resources, in this case the GR1 from the Vital Records of Burlington, as well as the manuscript number from NEHGS. Uh, from a manuscript that has the gravestone inscriptions. Thank you, David. We've gone over a lot of information today. We're already at the hour mark, but uh, we can spend a little more time with you and answer some questions. So if you have a question, go ahead and type it in the questions box. So a few questions regarding if a stone is illegible, especially due to moss or dirt or lichen or something else, are there certain substances or appropriate substances to clean gravestones to eliminate those um, kind of external factors? Or do you suggest contacting the cemetery office? Do you suggest hiring um, or contacting a professional to clean it? Um, what advice do you have for that? Well, there are a lot of different chemicals that I see even in genealogical conferences now, and not to name any particular to advertise for them, but there are ones that are out there that you can actually take and clean a gravestone. To be perfectly honest, if it's your own family stone versus adopting an entire cemetery and being generous, do find out what the rules and regulations are, um, because perhaps the cemetery has a way to clean it. Uh, in the case of one of my family stones, it's blackened because of the uh, the algae growth on it over the years, and they actually, for around a hundred dollars, have a company that will professionally come and clean the stone and actually make it legible again. So I would find out what the options are, especially if there's a cemetery office, and if you do decide to take it upon yourself please take a class, watch a video, find out what the hazards are, and tell the person that you're buying the chemical from what type of stone you're using it on to make sure you're not going to do more harm than good. We also have a number of questions regarding the accuracy of information that you might find on find a grave or billion graves. Can you kind of speak to that? Are these uh, is that information at all verified? Um, how does that content get up there? Um, any words of caution for folks listening? Find a grave and billion graves are purely volunteer efforts. So you could be a brand new genealogist, decide that you're going to now be the local historian, go out and transcribe a gravestone, and you could start interconnecting children with parents, assuming, well, they have the same last name. Maybe you're not very knowledgeable in reading the gravestone dates, and maybe is that a three, but it might actually be an eight. So sometimes people put in incorrect assumptions of what they think the inscription says. Sometimes they add biographical information. The thing that um, I should say annoys me the most is that after I've spent time transcribing a cemetery or putting it all on find a grave, and I know that I've gone corner to corner, every stone, no stone left unturned, and then I go back in and people have added people to that cemetery that one were buried there before the cemetery created was created, or in fact, there may be actually um, evidence that 
that uh, stone may have never existed before at all. Thank you. And a few questions regarding, you know, there's no headstone, there's no burial record, the office, if there is an office, doesn't seem to have one. Short of getting kind of a shovel and starting to dig, <laughs> uh, what advice or what, what options do people have for really verifying that their ancestor is buried in, in a certain location? Well, it's going to really vary for the time frame. I mean, if it's 17th and 18th century and early 19th century, perhaps burial records are an indication from a church, or if there actually was detailed town records that say the funerals and burials, because maybe there was a town uh, grave digger. Uh, these are indications that they may tell you at least the cemetery. Now, down to the actual spot. It's going to vary. By the time that we get into cemeteries that are organized by you bought a plot here, I bought a plot there, the dates of who's buried in that plot are going to vary from A to Z. However, that being said, if it's an old cemetery and it's a single grave and you think that it may have been a child or a brother of your ancestor that you're looking for, looking for the where the gravestones are grouped together, the single graves, follow the rows, see the types of stones that are there, look for the dates on the headstones. Now, you may never be able to determine exactly, shy of DNA in a backhoe, where your ancestor is, but at least you might know the general vicinity where they're buried. This is a case that I had when I was in Nova Scotia looking for my great-great-grandfather's grave in the 1860s. I know the section he's buried in, and I know that whereabouts the burials from that time frame were. I may have walked over a stone, but I'll never know it. Thank you. Now, Jenny asks, could cemeteries move burials from one location to another without notifying the family or even making a record of that move? Well, I would hope that if it's a 19th or 20th century, there would be some indication of the lot owner in a larger cemetery, Jenny. However, there are plenty of cases where uh, in the early days, cemeteries were moved because, well, a dam was being built. Or in the case of the Quabbin Reservoir in Massachusetts in the 1920s and 30s, where they took thousands of burials in various towns like Enfield, Massachusetts, et cetera, that don't exist anymore. They're underwater, and they've moved them to a centralized cemetery. Um, how do you notify somebody who died in 1790, back in 1920? Well, you could put an ad in the paper and say, by the way, we're moving your family member, but chances are they took the cemeteries by eminent domain to move them. If a modern-day cemetery decides to move part of it, like there are some that are down in southeastern New England, where the railroad went through and they moved all the graves or centralized at Springfield, Mass., the earliest cemetery was by the river, and they've all been moved to a modern 19th century cemetery, the question is, are the burials that were moved that didn't have headstones, where were they centralized? So we may never know. Um, but as far as indicating family members, most cemetery associations, and I'm on an association for the cemetery in my town, if there was to be any movement at all, it would be a legal situation. So then we could go and take and move your grandparents, if they were a lot owners, uh, and move them without you knowing, without you having a very good legal battle against that cemetery. Just a few more questions before we have to end today's presentation. Beverly asks, um, you, you showed a virtual cemetery that you had created on Find a Grave. Is it possible to search other people's uh, virtual cemeteries? And if so, if you could maybe just comment on how. That's that's a great, I, a really good question. Um, so all of my virtual cemeteries uh, are searchable by Google. So if I put in Civil War, um, Soldiers, Stoughton, Find a Grave, they'll actually put the landing page. My virtual cemeteries are not private, they're public. So um, an individual can go in there and actually see the uh, arrangement. Because most cases, they may not be my gravestone photographs to begin with, but I'm linking them all together for a unit like uh, all of our World War I veterans. I have over 200 gravestones. Some of them I've put on there. Some of them are not mine, but I've linked them so they're in one centralized place. It's very easy to create this, and it's also very easy to search it. I would use Google as a search key. Now, 
a few people have mentioned that Find a Grave and Billion Graves seems to be more focused on the U.S., cemeteries within the U.S. Are there websites that you know of for overseas or for other countries um, that kind of have that same mass uh, amount of of photographs and and cemetery data? Well, using England as an example, a lot of the county um, uh, register um, offices or the county genealogical societies oftentimes have taken out and gone out to the old churchyards and copied gravestones and memorial markers with inside of a church. Um, so they may exist on a local level. Uh, as far as the vastness of find a grave or billion graves, and it is getting an international component of it. I can tell you that I created one for the cemetery. My family came from in England when I was there a couple of years ago. Um, it is far reaching. So it's, even though the majority is U.S. and Canada, it does start to have that. But there's nothing of equal size uh, in the U.K. or, and say, Russia or France or anything like that. Um, but it doesn't hurt to Google. Google the name of the town and put in cemetery. You may be surprised. Some small historical society or individual may have transcribed gravestones in that community, and they have a list right online for you to look at. All right. Thank you so much, David, again, for staying 10 minutes longer to answer a few questions. If we haven't gotten to your question or as you start to review this material and you have additional questions, maybe consider scheduling a consultation, um, especially if you have a brick wall in your family history or you have a more specific issue with either cemetery research or um, other aspects of your genealogy. Uh, do consider either scheduling a consultation or hiring our research services teams. Uh, both of those resources are, and how to access those, uh, those emails are on your screen, and I'll, I will also include that in my follow-up email to you following today's broadcast. So thank you all again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you will have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.